Hello and welcome to AI. Today I'm going to show you how to prepare digital image files for print so they can be sold as digital downloads or used for print on demand or even sold privately as high quality prints. We'll go through the process of upscaling, formatting and overall improving the resolution of your images whether they're AI generated artwork or any other digital or digitized images you may want to print. I'm also going to show you how to automate and batch process your images to reduce your workload and ultimately optimize productivity. First of all, we need to specify what we actually mean by the, by the resolution of an image. When speaking of resolution, we usually refer to raster images, which differ from vector images because they're made up of a matrix of tiny little dots called pixels. The most common formats for raster images, image files are JPEG and PNG. The main difference between the two is given by the way they are compressed when they are modified and saved. JPEG images go through a compression process called lossy compression that reduces the image file size significantly, significantly making them easier to store. But this uh, advantage comes at a cost because some data from the image is permanently deleted during the compression process, compromising the quality of your file in the long run since each time you edit and save the image file, you lose more and more data. On the other hand, PNG files benefit from lossless compression. This means that no data is lost when the image is compressed, so the quality stays the same no matter how many times you edit and save the file. The trade-off with PNG images is that their lossless compression creates bigger files since they retain much more information. For the reasons I just outlined, I usually edit and process my images in PNG format and then convert them to JPEG when I uh, want to share them online or send them over to printing or POD facilities. One last thing that should be pointed out is that the two formats, uh, only of the two formats, only PNG can handle transparency. So if you need any part of your image to be transparent, then you would have to go with the PNG image file format rather than JPEG. So what is image resolution? An image's resolution really comes down to the number of pixels that exist within that image. So the higher the pixel count, the higher the resolution, and the more defined and detailed the image will be, especially if we need to view or print the image at a larger scale. The resolution of a digital image is measured in PPI, that stands for pixels per inch, while the resolution of a printed image is measured in DPI, and that stands for dots per inch. You may ask what's the difference between the two? Well, in Photoshop, the ratio of PPI to DPI is one to one, so although they are not effectively the same thing, as digital artists, the two values are somewhat interchangeable. You can uh, check the PPI of an image by opening it in Photoshop and checking its image size under the Image tab uh, from the top main menu bar and then selecting Image Size from the drop-down menu. You can also check the image's DPI on your computer, fi computer and file explorer on Windows by selecting the Details view. If you can't view the DPI by default, you can right-click on the top details bar up here and select More. Within the dialog box that pops up, you would then need to select Horizontal Resolution and Vertical Resolution and then hit OK. And the two columns will be added to the folder's file details showing the DPI of any image that may be contained within that same folder. There are also online tools that can help you discover the DPI of an image. You can find them by simply Googling Image DPI Analyzer or Image DPI Checker online and browse for the results to see which ones uh, suit you best. One that I believe stands out is this image size and quality analyzer for print at uh, pictorum.com forward slash uh, check print size. They even have this sort of diagram that lets you know the optimal sizes for print of the image file that is being analyzed. However, we'll be taking more of a hands-on approach to, to the matter in this walkthrough by learning how to calculate PPI and change it if necessary. Before we go forward, there is something else I would like to point out. Because Photoshop uses the terms resolution and pixel density as synonyms, I'll mostly uh, be doing the same, although they are two slightly different concepts that do, on some occasions, tend to overlap. I won't go too much into detail on this, but uh, just to give you an idea, according to Wikipedia, resolution describes the amount of detail on a physical surface or device, while pixel density describes the amount of pixel information contained in an image file regardless of its scale. 
A pixel has no inherent size or unit. A pixel is actually a sample, but when it is printed, displayed, or scanned, then the pixel has both a physical size, dimension, and a pixel density PPI. If this went completely over your heads, no worries. Uh, it will hopefully be clear now when I'll show you how to calculate the correct resolution and dimensions of an image file you would like to prepare for print. I will, however, link this resolution in the description below in case you want to have a look at it and uh, dive deeper into the matter. The standard for printed artwork is at least 300 dpi. Now, theoretically, to get the optimal length of the upscaled image in pixels, all you would have to do is multiply 300 ppi times the length of the image you intend to print. So let's say you would like to print an image that is 20 inches by 30 inches at 300 dpi. You would need uh, an upscaled image that is 20 inches times 300 ppi, so 6,000 pixels on one side, and that would be the width, by 30 inches times 300 ppi, that is equal to 9,000 pixels on the other side, and that would be the, the height. So ideally, to print out a poster that is 20 by 30 inches, you would need an image that is 6,000 pixels by 9,000 pixels. Now, this can get tricky because you may automatically think that all images that are 6,000 pixels by 9,000 pixels have a pixel density uh, or resolution of 300 ppi, but that's not the case. An image that is 6,000 by 9,000 pixels could really have any degree of pixel density or resolution. Actually, many online upscalers will maintain the original resolution of an image, and I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to upscale this image that is originally 3,000 pixels by 4,500 pixels with a resolution of 72 ppi to double its size, so 6,000 by 9,000 pixels, and download it to my device. If we open it up in Photoshop and go back to the image size dialog box, we can, we can see uh, that Photoshop is detecting and showing us the actual dimensions and resolution of the image, which are 6,000 pixels the width by 9,000 pixels the height at a resolution of 72 ppi. So as you can see, the image's dimensions were increased, but not its pixel density. Here in Photoshop, we can easily adjust the resolution of this image for print to 300 ppi, and to do so, we will have to decide if we want or need to resample the image or not. And so you may ask, uh, what does Photoshop mean by resampling? Really, resampling is just a different wording Photoshop uses for the process of upscaling. If resampling is selected, then Photoshop will add or remove the amount of pixels that is necessary to adjust the image's dimensions and or resolution to the values that have been chosen and introduced. Like all upscalers, Photoshop uses different AI models to carry out this process, and uh, you can choose any of the ones that are available from the drop-down menu next to the resolution option. You have a preview window here within the dialog box to get a glimpse of what the end result will look like after the resampling. As you can see from the preview, the resampling will result in a more or less visible altering of the image since the software will have to figure out the best way to fill in the missing pixel information it will need to reconstruct that same image at a larger scale. If on the contrary, resampling is deselected, then the original pixel count of the image will not be altered. For this reason, you will not be able to modify the dimensions of the image in pixels and the option will be grayed out from the width and height drop-down menus. Consequently, if resampling is selected, the image's dimensions and resolution can be changed independently. If resampling is not selected, then resolution and dimensions will be inter interdependent since the pixel count must always remain the same. Since our image is already 6,000 by 9,000 pixels, if we decided that the maximum dimensions we wanted to uh, physically print out the image at are 20 inches by 30 inches, then we know we won't need to resample because according to the calculations we saw earlier, 20 inches width and 30 inches height times 300 ppi gives us a total of 6,000 pixels by 9,000 pixels. So we ensure resampling is deselected and change the PPI value from 72 to 300. And we'll notice that the dimensions will immediately uh, adapt to our new resolution changing from uh, 83.333 inches in width and 125 inches in height to 20 to 30. 
If we want to take this a step further and increase the actual physical dimensions of the image we want to print to, let's say, 24 inches by 36 inches, then we would have to select resampling, ensure we have 300 ppi as our resolution, and adjust the width and the height in inches, ensuring this little chain symbol is selected to maintain the aspect ratio. As you can see, it has automatically adjusted the image file dimensions to uh, 7200 pixels by 10,800 pixels. When resampling, I suggest uh, you always adjust the PPI before changing the width and height values. Upscaling in Photoshop can be a viable option, but may not always be the best one. Other specialized upscalers like Topaz Gigapixel will generally outperform Photoshop when it comes to upscaling and enha enhancing image quality. I will compare the two tools uh, later on in this video so you can decide which one may uh, suit you best. There are, however, some tweaks you can make to your workflow that can help you get results in Photoshop that are quite close to Topaz Gigapixel, and I'll touch on those uh, further on in this walkthrough as well. There are lots of variables to consider, though, when choosing an upscaler or any kind of software to edit your images, and one important variable for me personally is the possibility to batch process and automate workflows. When you prepare art for artwork to sell as digital downloads or to upload on print-on-demand platforms, you'll need to optimize your workflows to adapt to the sheer volume of image files in different formats and dimensions that need to be produced. On Etsy, uh, sellers usually offer between five and seven different aspect ratios of their artwork, meaning that uh, if you were to sell digital downloads of a set of three paintings, you would have between 15 and 21 files you would need to produce, edit, upscale, crop, convert into different formats, rename, and upload to an online cloud file sharing service that customers can access to download the files after purchase. Doing all this manually would be extremely time consuming and probably not all that efficient and effective. In my opinion, another important factor that allows you to streamline your workflows is keeping your tech stack to a minimum. I find that the more you need to switch from one piece of software to another to complete your tasks, the more time it takes overall to get the job done. That considered, I tend to choose to work with programs and applications that allow me to carry out the maximum number of tasks all in one place and weigh out the pros and cons of the software's performance against uh, improved productivity. A piece of software I touched on earlier comparing it to Photoshop is Topaz Gigapixel, and as I mentioned, it is known to offer very high quality upscaled imagery, being considered probably one of the best, if not the best, upscaler on the market at the moment. Topaz Gigapixel does allow batch processing, and uh, another very positive thing about it is that it integrates with Photoshop, meaning that it can be used inside of the Photoshop working environment. So if you're using Photoshop as your main image post-processing and editing tool, then using Topaz Gigapixels uh, within the tool could be a valid option to upscale your images. It needs to be mentioned, though, that uh, if you're on a tight budget, uh, Topaz Gigapixel does come with a fairly costly price tag of $99. On the upside though, it is a one-time lifetime purchase, meaning that as opposed to other subscription-based software you would be paying for indefinitely, once you've bought a license to use the program, you can download it locally on your computer and access it anytime at no additional cost. If you consider that $99 works out to be $8.25 a month for just one year, I think it's a pretty good investment and in the long run, you will obviously end up saving money if you're using subscription-based software instead. You can test drive Topaz Gigapixel AI before purchasing the software, and to do so, just come to the web uh, page topazlabs.com forward slash gigapixel dash AI and click on the try for free button and uh, follow the instructions provided. If you don't have a Photoshop subscription yet and you may be thinking of getting one, Adobe has a Photoshop photo photography plan that starts at only $9.99 a month and they also offer a 7 day free trial in case you want to test drive the software to follow me while I go through this video tutorial. If you intend to sign up for any of the software programs I use in this video, um, I'll have links available in the description below. These may be affiliate links, which means that uh, you pay the same price or less for signing up to the platform's services through the link by clicking on it 
and I get a percentage of the transaction after you sign up or subscribe that in return helps me produce more videos like the one you're watching right now. If the computing power of your device is very limited and the upscaling process is taking too long for you when you uh, when using local software like Photoshop and Topaz Gigapixel, then you might want to consider using an online upscaler instead. One of the most recent and promising online upscalers out at the moment is Magnific AI. This piece of software does come with uh, quite a hefty price tag though, starting at $39 a month for 200 normal upscales all the way up to $299 a month for 1,600 normal upscales, which basically means the higher the scale factor of your upscaled images, the more tokens you'll be using from your subscription and the more you'll be spending. I'll give you a sample of what Magnific AI can do when I compare Photoshop to Totopaz Giggle Pixel AI upscales in this video. There are a myriad of upscalers now on the market and I, I will most likely give you a rundown of some of my favorite ones in future videos. So I would suggest you subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for any new content I may be publishing. By the way, this image I'm using as a sample image was generated with Midjourney AI. Here's the prompt in case you want to generate the image yourself. I created this image using the workflow I outlined in my previous video called Easily Recreate Top Selling Etsy Artwork with Midjourney AI Step by Step. I'll add that as an ending card to this video and also add a link to the playlist it belongs to in the description below in case you want to may have a look. So getting back to the walkthrough, apart from the image size option I touched on earlier, another way to upscale images in Photoshop is via the Super Zoom feature. SuperZoom is part of a set of AI tools that Photoshop released about a year and a half ago called NeuroFilters. To access the NeuroFilters, you would have to go to the Filters tab on the top main menu bar and then select NeuroFilters from the drop-down menu. From the NeuroFilters panel that opens on the right-hand side of the screen, you would then toggle the SuperZoom filter on. If there's no toggle switch available and you get this cloud download icon instead, that means you will have to download the filter to your device by clicking on the icon to be able to use it. Once your image is open inside the filter panel, you can decide how many times you would like to scale your image up by clicking on the plus magnifying glass icon. You can also select enhance image details that will create an overall crisper image. Remove JPEG artifacts will do just the opposite. It will tend to smoothen out contours, but uh, at the loss of the overall uh, sharpness of the image. Um, as a side note, in my opinion, when the remove JPEG artifacts option is selected, the results of the upscale are very similar to the Gaussian blur filter being applied uh, to the image. You also have these noise reduction and sharpness sliders uh, you can experiment with to fine tune your results. Then you have the enhanced face details, which is pretty much uh, self-explanatory. Nevertheless, you can decide not to apply any of these additional filters and uncheck them all. That will lead to quicker processing times, but poor uh, image results. Uh, you'll notice uh, a little progress bar will pop up uh, underneath the original image here on the left-hand side when you upscale the image. This will give you an indication of how long it will take for your image to be processed. Since this is all happening locally on your computer, the time it may take for Photoshop to carry out the edits may vary according to the capabilities of your own device. Once the upscaling process is finished, you can always check any changes that have been made uh, by zooming in on the preview image in the window on the left. Now, it's very important that new document is selected as an output if you want to upscale and download the image in its entirety since this will result in the creation of a completely new upscaled image. If on the other hand, new layer is selected as the output, then uh, Photoshop will only render a zoomed in detail of the image as a new layer of your original image. Basically, the new layer will contain the part of the image that is visible in this uh, super zoom window. One thing I would like you to notice is that when you're upscaling using the super zoom filter, the output image will already have a resolution of 300 PPI, so you won't have to worry about adjusting the pixel density for print. One last method we'll be looking at for upscaling images in Photoshop is the Topaz Gigapixel integration I mentioned earlier. To access the Gigapixel AI integration in Photoshop, you need to go to File and then Automate and uh, click on Topaz Gigapixel AI. Note that if you haven't opened an image in Photoshop already, this option will be grayed out. 
From here, you'll be redirected to the Gigapixel AI des desktop uh, application. First thing you may want to do is uh, choose the view panel you would like to work in. I would start off with the comparison view, which allows you to view and compare four of the six AI upscaling models available, which are standard, lines, art and CG, HQ, low res, and very compressed. You can then move to a side-by-side, -side, split, or single view once you've cut down your preferences to a single AI model. Switching on the auto toggle uh, on the right will let Gigapixel AI decide which upscaling model is the best for your image, but note that it won't work in the comparison view mode. You have three options for the resize mode, but we're going to choose either width or height uh, rather than scale because that will allow us to control the image's PPI. Here, we'll enter the maximum dimensions in inches or centimeters uh, we intend to print the image at and adjust the PPU, the pixel per unit, to 300 pixels per inch. You can click on any one of the images in the grid to make any adjustments from the settings panel on the right, and uh, you can also change the AI model that is being used by selecting it as well from the options on the right-hand side panel. Just like in the AI model section, you have the auto toggle in the top right corner of the settings section. By switching it on, you can let Gigapixel AI automatically adjust the settings for each one of the upscalers. Once you've decided on the model you want to go with and you're happy with the settings, you simply click on the corresponding image in the viewing panel and hit the apply button at the bottom right. When the software is done processing, the image will automatically open up in Photoshop. From here, you can continue to edit the image in Photoshop and download it like you would any other image. This is interesting because we can now integrate Gigapixel AI into the automation process we'll be looking into in a minute. I just want to quickly compare some of the results we got using the different methods we just outlined to upscale our images in Photoshop so we can get an idea of what method we may want to use in our own workflows. The image files I started off with were 700 pixels by uh, 1,125 pixels at a resolution of 72 ppi. I upscaled all the images eight times at a resolution of 300 ppi. So the final dimensions of the images at 100% are 6,000 pixels by 9,000 pixels. And the maximum print size for these images would therefore be uh, 20 inches by 30 inches. I'm going to choose the best two of the four images I upscaled in Photoshop and compare them with the best two out of the four other images I upscaled in Topaz Gigapixel. These are the four Photoshop images and the clear winners uh, for me are the two images that were upscaled with the super zoom filter using the enhance image detail option. On the other hand, out of the four Topaz Gigapixel images, I prefer the image upscaled using the HQ model and also the standard model upscale. Now I'm going to compare my preferred Photoshop image uh, of the two images I picked earlier with my preferred Topaz Gigapixel image. The Photoshop image is the super zoom upscale with the enhanced image detail option alone. And the Topaz Gigapixel image is the HQ model upscale. Overall, I have to say that Topaz Gigapixel did a better job of maintaining the upscale crisp and detailed throughout the whole image and would be, for me, the clear winner out of the two, although I am very impressed with the super zoom image as well. It did sort of blur out here and there and lose some detail in the background, but all in all, I think it did a very good job of producing a solid, high-quality upscaled image. Nevertheless, to cast aside any doubts regarding the quality of these upscaled images, it would be good practice to actually send them off to print and test them out. As I mentioned earlier, there was a way though to tweak your workflow in Photoshop to get even better results, and I'll explain how to do that now. As a premise, I would need to point out that the higher the resolution and size of the original image you would like to upscale, the higher quality the outcome of your upscaled image will be in Photoshop or Gigapixel AI. If you are generating images in mid-journey, you may want to carry out an initial upscale of the image with their upscale times two or times four option before processing it in Photoshop or any other upscaling software just to kickstart that upscaling process and give it that initial boost it may need from the enhanced quality of the original image. Even if you're not using an AI image generator, I would still try to create your original image at the best possible resolution for the same reasons. 
I definitely suggest this if you decide to use the super zoom filter in Photoshop as you'll be able to significantly increase the quality of your upscales this way. Actually, if you upscale your images four times in mid-journey and two times in Photoshop with uh, super zoom, your results will be quite similar to Gigapixel AI as you can see from this comparison. Nevertheless, I think uh, Gigapixel uh, AI may still have a slight edge over Photoshop in this comparison, namely when it comes down to rendering textures and fine details, although we are getting very nitpicky at this point. Just because I mentioned it earlier, I wanted to quickly throw in a Magnific AI upscale with the two images we just compared so you can have an idea of what it can do, and I have to say that the results are uh, also quite impressive. Uh, I won't go into detail on how this tool works as it's a bit off topic, but if you'd like a more detailed uh, review of Magnific AI's upscaler, let me know in the comments below. Now that we've seen different ways to upscale images in Photoshop, I'd like to show you how to automate the process to be more efficient and increase productivity. First, I'm going to need a source folder where I can place all the artwork that needs to be upscaled. Uh, you may have already created various folders with different collections of artwork you made and saved on your computer beforehand. Uh, then uh, we'll create an output or destination folder to save our upscaled images in and we'll give that a name. Now we are going to record a Photoshop action to automate the process. Actions are basically a set of instructions that we put together to tell Photoshop which tasks we want it to perform and in which order. Uh, we create actions by recording a sequence of tasks and commands as we perform them inside of Photoshop. Once they are recorded, actions can be replayed to automate the same series of tasks on a single image or on a batch of images through batch processing. To record an action, we come over to the Actions panel, and if it's hidden, you can go over to the Windows tab on the main menu and select Actions from the drop-down to make it visible. Uh, the first thing we do is click on the folder icon at the bottom of the panel to create a new set. This is simply a folder that will contain all the actions pertaining to that specific set or collection of actions. We can name it as we please and hit OK. After that, we select the set and click on the little plus icon to create a new action. We name that as well and hit, re hit the record button. My advice is to be uh, detailed and specific when writing the name of, of the action. If, for example, you're creating an action to upscale images, include both the input and the output dimensions of the image and other important details to remind you what the action is used for. From this moment, you are basically recording your action. All we need to do now is uh, carry out our edits in the same sequence we would want them to be applied to all of the other images we would like to process. In our case, let's say we want to upscale our images using the super zoom filter as shown earlier. We can first of all see if we're recording or not by checking if the little red rec record indicator on the bottom panel menu is lit. Uh, then we'll just upscale the image as we did earlier and press the stop playing uh, recording button when we're done. If at any time you need to momentarily pause your recording, you can always hit the stop button and start recording again whenever you're ready by clicking on the record button. So I'm going to upscale the image and I'm also going to save the image to the preferred output folder that in our case is the upscaled images folder we just created by clicking on save as or save a copy from the file drop down menu. One last step that I would add to the action is closing any open images by right clicking on one of the open images uh, tabs and selecting a close all and opting not to save the changes to the image. At this point though, uh, your action is still recording, so we would have to go back and stop the recording. To do that, we can click on the window tab uh, in the main top uh, menu bar, then actions from the drop down menu, and then we hit the stop playing recording button at the bottom of the actions panel. Adding this last step to the action will come in handy further down our workflow when we batch process our image files as it will avoid having too many images open at once, which could cause the application to lag or even stall or crash. Once the action is recorded, you can play it on uh, any image by opening the image you intend to edit and hitting the action play button down here. This is a very basic action. Uh, actions can obviously be very long and articulate, but in my experience, the more complex they are, uh, the more unstable they are. Sometimes even the slightest deviation from the original conditions in which the action was created can veer the whole process off track 
and some tasks just aren't very well supported and tend to be extremely inconsistent. Based on my previous trials, uh, you'll end up saving time if you automate small batches of tasks at a time instead of trying to troubleshoot super complex actions uh, that will work one day but end up breaking the next. If you ever do come across a step in one of your actions that is causing you trouble or that is inconsistent, one easy way to fix the action is to insert a stop wherever the action is not working properly. This will allow you to carry out that particular step of the action manually. You can then restart the action by hitting the play button. The stop function will also allow you to write instructions that will pop up whenever the action hits the stop so you can be reminded of what task needs to be performed. As a quick side note, if you include the GigglePixel AI integration as one of the steps of your Photoshop actions, the application will launch automatically, but you may have to choose the AI model, adjust the settings, and initiate the upscaling processes manually. Once the image has been upscaled and open in Photoshop, the action will automatically restart and continue where it left off. One last word of advice when using actions is to be consistent uh, when preparing the images that will be submitted to the automation in particular regarding the dimensions of the input image, but really anything that could potentially cause the whole process to derail. Now that we have our action, we can either play it on single images, or we can use batch automation to edit different groups of images at a time. To batch process, we go to File from the main menu and then select Automate and Batch from the dropdown. This dialog box will pop up, and here you can choose the action you would like to play. The last action you use or create will be the default action. Then you can pick your source folder and uh, choose from the options available. In our case, we don't have any open commands, no subfolders, and if we had issues with any of these dialog boxes, um, we would come and select these options here to stop them from popping up during the automation. After that, we uh, decide where to save our log errors file. That is uh, just a simple text document that will log any errors uh, that were encountered during the, during the execution of the automation. And uh, finally, we can choose the destination folder. Uh, ensure the override actions uh, save as commands is checked. Uh, note that this option will only work if there are save or save as steps in the action. Then you have the filing name. Uh, you can obviously set this up however suits you. This is how I set it up and how it works best for me. Uh, extension in capital letters followed by one digital serial number and uh, I set the starting serial number value to one. If this last step of the automation is not set up right, uh, one predominant issue you may encounter when batch processing with actions is that it will rewrite and copy over any existing files uh, with the same default name, usually untitled dash one, making the whole process absolutely useless. That's why we're telling the automation to change each file's name to its extension in capital letters, followed by a numerical sequence starting at uh, number one. Now, if everything is set, you can hit OK to start the automation and let it run. You'll be able to follow the action steps uh, as they are being carried out in Photoshop. And if you check your destination folder, you'll see that it will be gradually uh, populating with the edited images. Just for the record, uh, Megapixel AI does also upscale images in batches uh, when used as a standalone application outside of Photoshop. Uh, Wade McCaster uh, has a detailed video tutorial explaining how to do this uh, on his YouTube channel, Creator Impact. Uh, I'll link that video in the description and possibly add it as an end card uh, to this video as well. You'll be able to record actions for all of the methods I'm using in this walkthrough to upscale images in Photoshop. Actions can be saved as uh, standalone uh, .atn files and installed in Photoshop when needed. To do that, you click on the hamburger menu in the right in the top right corner of the Actions panel. Uh, then uh, load Actions from the dropdown, and then you would need to double-click the .atn file um, from the folder where the action is stored. I wanted to share some of the actions I'm creating in this tutorial with you, but I realized that the file and folder paths recorded in some of the steps of the actions were specific to my computer and obviously wouldn't work on any other device except mine. 
So we've upscaled our images and the next step is to resize them to the most uh, commonly used aspect ratios for printed images, which are 1 to 1, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, 11 to 14, and 5 to 7, which is very close to the ISO ratios that are A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on. The fastest way I found to resize my artwork uh, to adjust it to all of those aspect ratios is to upscale the image to the maximum of its uh, resolution and size in inches at uh, a 1 to 1 ratio if possible or 4 to 5 ratio for vertical images and 5 to 4 for horizontal images which are the closest to, one, to the 1 to 1 ratio and uh, then crop the image down from there. So we're basically only upscaling one of each of our images to its maximum dimensions based on the biggest size you want to print the image out at and uh, then resizing that same image by cropping it down to the different aspect ratios we'll be using for print. Just to clarify, when offering digital downloads on Etsy, for example, you'll only be giving the customer one file for every aspect ratio. They can then uh, print that image out starting at the image's biggest size in inches or centimeters all the way down to the smallest size uh, since they'll always be able to print out the, the same high resolution image within its aspects ratios range of standard sizes. For example, an image that is 6000 by 9000 pixels at 300 ppi can be printed at a maximum size of 20 by 30 inches and then also printed in smaller sizes like 16 by 24, 12 by 18, 10 by 15, or any other 2 by 2 to 3 aspect ratio image size that's smaller than 20 by 30. Here's a list of uh, some standard print sizes in inches with their corresponding dimensions in pixels at a resolution of 300 ppi. Obviously, uh, you are going to treat this process a little bit differently depending on whether or not your image or artwork has negative space around a central subject like the sample image I've been using uh, throughout this walkthrough. If you created your artwork in mid-journey, to ensure you have enough negative space on the edges of your image to crop into, I would zoom out by a factor of 1.2 to 1.5 and adjust the aspect ratio to your liking with the custom zoom feature. At this point, you can upscale the image even further in mid-journey to give it that better starting point I mentioned earlier for the other upscalers to work on. Or if you don't want to use your fast hours, you can just leave the image uh, at its original dimensions and start your upscale from there outside of mid-journey. You can obviously uh, easily add space around the subject of an image in Photoshop as well using the content aware or generative AI fills. It really comes down to personal preference and convenience, I think, considering that the quality of AI-generated outpainting and in-painting in, -painting in uh, both Midjourney and Photoshop is very high. Once you've upscaled the image to its biggest size in inches and to its highest resolution in PPI, you can start cropping it in Photoshop. I usually start from the 1 to 1 ratio if it's available, or 4 to 5 or 5 to 4. Uh, ratios for respectively vertically or horizontal orientation and gradually work my way down. The sequence from wider to slimmer aspect ratios would be 1 to 1, 4 to 5, uh, 11 to 14, 3 to 4, 5 to 7, uh, the ISO uh, A1 ratio, and then 2 to 3. You can obviously automate this process just like we did with the upscaling. If you want to add a new aspect ratio to your defaults, you can select clear from the top toolbar and input your custom aspect ratio values. You can then save the new aspect ratio as a preset by clicking on the aspect ratio selector and then new crop preset at the bottom of the dropdown. Now our image files are upscaled and resized properly. The next step I would take would be to convert the files from PNG to high quality JPEG files since, as outlined earlier, JPEG files are much more versatile and easier and less expensive to store than PNG files. To convert these PNG files to JPEG, uh, we uh, once again use an automation by going to File in the main menu, then Scripts from the dropdown, and then we'll select Image Processor. In step one, we'll select the source, fo source folder. In step two, we can select the destination folder. And in step three, under file type, we ensure that save as JPEG is checked and resize to fit is unchecked. Then I would suggest selecting the quality parameter between eight and 10. 
Next step is to rename your files. Uh, the desktop application I use to bulk rename files and folders is nonetheless called bulk rename utility. These are my presets for the tool. I'll drop a shortcut file with these settings in the shared drive folder with all the other resources for this video. All you have to do is find the folder containing the files you want to rename, select the files you want to rename, and rename the files in the prefix field contained in the add box. And then hit rename button, the rename button to complete the process. A bonus tip here, if you need to bulk delete files, go to the parent folder containing all the files you want to delete, type the extension of the files you want to delete or a recurring letter, word, or number in the file's title or metadata, uh, then select uh, all by pressing Ctrl A and uh, go ahead and delete everything. And uh, finally, we can upload the images to a cloud storage file sharing service. I personally use my Google Workspace account drive to store and share my digital artwork. I find it particularly convenient, especially if you're selling on Etsy, because almost everyone has a Google account and it's uh, something that most people are familiar with and can relate to. Pricing for Google Storage goes from the standard free 15 um, gigabyte plan uh, you get when you uh, open your Google account to paid plans at uh, $1.99 for 100 gig, uh, $2.99 for 200 gigabytes, and uh, $9.99 for 2 terabytes. To share a link to a folder or a file in your Google Drive, click on the three dots at the top left corner of the folder or file you want to share, select share from the drop down menu, and then change the general access settings from restricted to anyone with a link. Ensure the role is set to viewer so the file or folder will only be able to be viewed and not edited, and then click uh, on the copy link button to copy the link to your clipboard and hit done. Other file sharing services you may want to look into are Playbook that have two free plans, a standard 100 gigabyte plan and a, a four terabyte free plan for artists and designers. I believe there is an application process you would need to go through to access that plan by submitting your portfolio. They also have a paid team plan that costs $25 for the monthly admin fee plus $12 a month for every additional team member and uh, the allowance in storage space is five terabyte, I believe, uh, per team member, but it's not uh, that clear on the website. And there is also uh, WeTransfer with costs that range from a free two gigabyte plan to a paid uh, $15 pro plan that allows for one terabyte storage and a premium plan for $25 a month that gives you unlimited storage with no file size limits on transfers. I think that should wrap it up for this video. There is certainly more to talk about on this and other AI related topics, so I invite you to stay tuned and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any of the new content that is being published. Thanks for watching and see you soon.